Well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, and um, warm welcome to this panel session here today on the just transition in the global south. I'm very excited to uh, join the ESG forum this year and uh, to speak on this topic as well. We have a stellar group of panelists today speaking on a very timely issue that is just transition in the global south. And for those of you who've been following the question or the topic of just transition, uh, you realize this is also a very timely topic because next year is the 10th year anniversary of the Paris Agreement. So by way of introduction, my name is Ken Bever. I'm currently a research associate at the University of Cambridge. That's at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. And uh, I'll be stepping in to chair on behalf of uh, Professor Chuck Sokareke, who's currently in this post. But that notwithstanding, uh, we have a great set of presentations here today. And because time is a little bit gone, so I'll just um, kind of give you an overview of how we plan this session. So first start, we'll uh, have each of our presenters giving us a, kind of a set of discussions, a rather presentation on their topic. And then from there, we'll have a block of time for Q&A. So should you have any uh, questions, please uh, pop them in the Q&A through the Q&A function on Zoom, and we'll collect them and uh, we'll get our panelists to answer your questions at the end of the session. So to get us started, um, I'll give the first presentation and then followed by my colleagues, uh, Pratak, Esther, and then Ruben, and then we'll have the Q&A session. So we'll talk about, um, I'll talk about just transition and how the field is currently structured, looking at, at the, an analysis of the literature. That is the authors, uh, the kind of papers that are published, the themes or concepts that are come, uh, have come up, et cetera. And Prathap will talk to us about intellectual property rights and how they enable or hinder uh, a global just transition. And then Esther will talk to us about um, integrating um, the development component uh, into the just transition discussions. And Ruben will close out the presentations by giving us a broad of reflections on how to think about um, just transition. Great, so I'll start with my presentation, which I'll try to keep quite brief. I don't know that you can see my screen. So in this paper, we map the um, called hegemonic acculturation. We map the intellectual landscape of the global just transition. Because everyone is talking about global just transition or just transition, what exactly does that entail? So it's a, com it's a collaboration uh, between uh, Chuck Sokareke and Ruben and myself. So the motivation for this paper was, you know, there's a lot of discussion about just transition, everyone talks about it. And in the scholarly literature, you can see there's been a proliferation of the literature, especially in the last 10 years or so. And some of the uh, aspects, um, for example, from looking at the years from um, 1986 to 2024, this kind of sometime this year, um, it's quite a getting, using data from our web of science, quite a huge number of articles that have been published many journals that have published the articles, quite a number of authors uh, as well, uh, et cetera, <clears throat> and co-authorship as well. So we'll dig into the details in the succe succeeding um, slides, but the key points are, you know, there's an exponential growth of the literature and our research question, then what is the intellectual structure of this literature? So in terms of theory, we look at the power, influence, and the politics of knowledge, uh, we advance the concept of hegemonic intellectual acculturation, where we argue that you know the discourse on just transition is quite hegemonic in that it's controlled by a few elite intellectuals who have really framed the field, done us a service by providing us a way of thinking about the tensions of climate commitments, but also meeting those commitments. Uh, there are elite coalitions who also kind <clears> of <throat> develop and coalesce around certain ideology. There's a question of also acculturation. Uh, beyond discourse. And uh, it's kind of famous idea put forward by Ali Mazrui, who was a Kenyan scholar about how our total education system uh, shapes how we think or our mode of reasoning 
And, and that kind of also determines our intellectual style of the kinds of questions we ask, how we respond to them or address them. Um, Mazuru published his uh, paper two years before Foucault, who talked about discussive formations in the archaeology of knowledge, also showing how we all are acculturated to think in, in a certain way. And Edward Said and uh, the African philosopher V.Y. Mudimbe also talked about othering, where we, when we construct knowledge, there's a self and the other, and the tensions between the two. The third strand <clears throat> that we draw on is the notion of epistemic regimes, uh, where there's an entanglement of science and values. And as you will see, even us scientists, so to speak, have been researching on just transition or global just transition. There's been a mix of science and values and that has significant implications. Lastly, we look at, we use the concept of paradigm shifts, um, one of uh, which Kuhn developed and how kind of knowledge changes or comes in, um, you know, concepts are developed, they change, uh, get reused, get discarded, etc. And we talk about also the issue of protective belts where a core kind of set of knowledge that defines a field gets rightified or gets um, kind of protected by other literature that uh, emphasizes it. So the basic point is, number one, the discourse is very quite hegemonic, controlled by a small group of scholars, and they have a way of thinking about the issue that um, is shaped by their conditions and their education system. Um, I don't know, I just happened to my slides. Yep, so the findings, a couple of key findings. The first is conceptual, where for those who've been following the uh, global environmental and climate politics uh, debates for, for decades, will be familiar with this conceptual distinction of how do we frame the climate question. We frame it purely as an environmental issue uh, where you know it's about reducing emissions, or do we talk about and where energy is central, or do we have a more kind of um, expansive view of climate change, which is kind of part of a developmental problem. And you can see the focus of energy, but also the broader notion of sustainable development appearing as two kind of conceptual um, conceptual camps in, in, this, in this literature. If we plot it across time, you can see also the kind of themes that the literature has been tackling have changed over time from a huge focus of energy to kind of um, contested um, kind of development and other aspects coming in. So this shows you that this literature has been very dynamic and it has not been static. The second uh, aspect which our uh, finding which we would like to share is um, there's a kind of a core of elite authors who really defined and shaped the field. Of course, that's a positive thing because they've given it a lot of energy and you can see from the graph um, in terms of energizing the field, giving us a concept that we can work with and uh, developing it further. And using uh, Lorca's law, which is a bibli bibliometric method, uh, we can find it was confirmed that it is indeed a small group of very elite authors who really shaped and defined uh, the field in addition to giving it quite some quite some energy. And you can see where the countries where they come from. Uh, we can see the US, we can see Germany, uh, we can see the UK, um, and even China. So. Um, which has some very interesting implications, as we'll see. We've also had quite a number of very influential journals, of course, that these scholars publish in, and uh, following uh, Bradford's law, a small set of journals accounts for a huge proportion of the literature. So we can see it's not just about the authors, but it's about the uh, outlets that they uh, publish their research. And so we have a small group of very influential journals that have set their agenda and publish most of the consequential papers on uh, just transition. If we look at the global uh, geographical collaboration, we'll see this kind of um, collaboration between North America, a uh, huge kind of hub in Europe, especially Western Europe, uh, with some collaborations in East Asia as well. Uh, so this is not these are not all the collaborations, but this just kind of shows you how you know the um, the kind of collaborations um, are structured in a geographical sense. So in conclusion, um, what points could we draw from um, the discussion? Number one is the role of power and scientific authority in setting the agenda 
of the topics that we usually discuss, including uh, just transition. Second is the question of um, research capabilities. Uh, it really matters uh, having the resources, but also the outlets such as journals to uh, be able to publish your work and socialize other scholars around the concepts. There's a question of also international policy and partnerships and where if you look at the concept of just transition, it's not just about uh, scholarship, but it's also about policy and about partnerships. And lastly, um, as you mentioned, you know, there's an entanglement of science and values, but that raises the question about ethics of scholarship and practice, especially as it regards uh, collaborations. So thanks for your attention, and I'll conclude my presentation there and hand over to Pratap to tell us about how intellectual property rights uh, hinder or support the global just transition. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, it was really interesting talk. So I'll try to share my screen and... Uh, Yep. So I'll be talking about uh, the importance of patents and uh, especially the intellectual property uh, in uh, climate technology transfer in the global south. So the structure of my presentation today is uh, I'll try to try to explain why intellectual property is cru crucial uh, in just transition and technology transfer and especially global south and the impact of uh, TRIPS provisions. Uh, TRIPS is an international agreement um, signed by the WTO. Uh, it, it, it has specific provisions for technology transfer. So I have looked into specific provisions for the TRIPS and uh, kind of critiqued uh, whether, what, what is the relevancy uh, for the technology transfer in the Global South and specifically looked into the patentability provisions, exclusions and trade secrets and uh, TRIPS plus provisions and the impact of trade agreement. I'll also be talking about uh, rethinking uh, the technology transfer for climate action uh, from an IP perspective and a uh, few more recommendations and conclusion. So why intellectual property is cru crucial for just transition and technology transfer? So IP rights are uh, at the intersection of uh, technological progress, uh, climate action and economic development shaping the contours of global competitiveness. So while IP systems are fundamentally designed to safeguard the in interests of inventors and innovators, thereby fostering an environment conductive to creativity and progress, they can inadequately you know, erect formidable uh, barriers to the fl free flow of uh, technology, especially technologies critical for the climate mitigation and adaptation. So we have IP rights, especially, as I said, they incentivize innovation, which uh, spurs R&D to create new, tech, uh, new climate technologies. And, uh, you know, stringent IP regimes can create barriers to access and dissemination of technologies, especially for the developing and, you know, the least developed countries. And TRIPS agreement, um, as I said, has significantly influenced the technology transfer and the innovation landscape all over the world, especially for the signatories. And TRIPS has been critiqued for uh, disproportionately benefiting technologically advanced nations, so which is uh, especially important uh, when we are looking at it from the perspective of Global South. So why, glo why Global South? So since the establishment of TRIPS and before, so IP royalties have predominantly gravitated towards uh, Global North. So especially in the era where climate change poses a significant threat to the humanity, the role of technology in mitigating its effects cannot be overstated. You know, So this is uh, particularly true for developing nations in the global south where the impacts of climate change are often most acutely felt. And these countries, while striving for economic growth, also face the urgent need for the to build the climate resilience. So Global South faces severe impacts of climate change due to geographic and socioeconomic factors and the limited technological and financial capacity hinders adaptation and mitigation of these efforts. And the equitable access to climate innovations is essential for energy transition, leaving no country behind. 
So these are some of the key points for the for the reasoning of why global south. So now looking into specific provisions of uh, trips agreement. So generally, trips agreement uh, with its preventability provisions plays a uh, pivotal role in the technopolitical landscape of climate change mitigation and adaptation. So there are few important articles in the TRIPS agreement that are uh, especially relevant for the technology transfer and just transition. So few more articles 27.1 and 27.2. Uh, it requires, uh, 27.1 requires countries to provide uh, patent protection for inven uh, inventions in all fields of technology. So especially, so while uh, Article 27.1 encourages innovation, it also creates barriers to technology transfer. So these costs often render these technologies inaccessible to developing countries in the global south and directly uh, implicating, say, impacting their ability to pursue sustainable development and climate resilience, uh, which is a core aspects of uh, you know just transition framework. And coming to articles uh, uh, 27.2, so it's uh, this is very specifically relevant to uh, you know climate change because it can be leveraged by developing countries in the global south to facilitate access to crucial uh, climate technologies. Like for example, uh, the provision can be used to exclude from patentability certain uh, climate technologies that are essential for public health or in environmental protection. And I think few uh, countries have actually used this provision, uh, especially countries like India. And coming to Article 39 of TRIPS, which actually discusses about the trade secrecy provisions. So trade secrets can include a wide range of information, such as uh, manufacturing processes, uh, customer lists, and research and development information. It is also called as confidential information in some jurisdictions. So they are a form of intellectual property that can be crucial for businesses to maintain a competitive edge. So in a larger narrative, uh, the role of uh, Article 39 TRIPS is not just about legal protection of uh, undisclosed information, but also about how it shapes the power dynamics between uh, developed and developing nations. So it provides protection for undisclosed information, also known as trade secrets. And the one best example for the trade secrets is uh, the formula of Coke or the recipe of Coke is actually protected uh, using the trade secret protection. And the protection of climate technologies in the form of the trade secrets can limit the ability of these countries to access, adapt and use these technologies. And Article 65 and 66, they are facilitating a just transition technology. Uh, Article 65 allows for tra transitional agreements, granting developing countries additional time to comply with the uh, provisions of the TRIPS. And uh, Article 66 mandates developed countries to provide incentives to their enterprises and institutions to promote technology transfer to the developing uh, and least developed countries. So this is specifically important for uh, the just transition. And especially Article 66 is directly aligned with the goals of a just transition, which seeks to ensure that uh, the shift towards a sustainable and low carbon economy does not leave behind the most you know, vulnerable, vulnerable nations. So trips plus, uh, so, the international trade agreements or uh, multi-country trade agreements uh, are the ones that those are considered as TRIPS plus. So these goes beyond uh, the TRIPS agreements, the TRIPS standards, further restricting the use of these flexibilities. So the role of trade agreements in promoting equitable technology transfer to the global south remains a complex issue that needs consideration and uh, stringent IP rights protections measures and TRIPS plus provisions in some RTS create barriers to technology access for developing countries. So as an example of this, uh, I have tried to look into a list of, um, you know, inter-country, multi-country trade agreements, and uh, which are actually, uh, you know, uh, there are climate technologies uh, that are specifically related to, as you can see in the slide, uh, CO2 permit trading, clean energy, decarbonization. But one thing which is observed is uh, there is no specific IP waiver discussed in between, uh, you know, and another important thing is these agreements were signed in between uh, a developing country, or, you know, a developed nation or technology advanced nation and a developing nation or, you know, least developed countries. So this is an uh, important thing that there is no specific IP waiver uh, for the technology transfer. 
So looking in all, looking into all of these things, there is a need of you know rethinking IP for the climate action. So we need to you know kind of move beyond the traditional emphasis on IP rights and the considering the potential of trade policy to facilitate climate technology flows. So as a, as the global community grapples with the urgent challenge of climate change, uh, I think there is a going recognition that we must uh, rethink the mechanisms of technology transfer to support the climate agenda effectively. And uh, innovative solutions such as you know patent pools and open source approaches have been proposed and means of, uh, to balance the incentives for the innovation with the need for equitable access to climate technologies. You know, patent pools uh, which involve aggregating patents uh, within a particular field and making them act available to all participants can reduce barriers uh, to entry and encourage uh, collaborative innovation. And uh, fostering international cooperation and capacity building initiatives uh, uh, develop by the developing uh, by developing nations uh, such as uh, joint R&D ventures would also help uh, you know uh, enhance the technology transfer activities in between uh, uh, from the developed nations to the developing or least developed nations. So a few more recommendations from my study and conclusion. So as we discuss the policy implications and recommendations emerging from this research, it becomes evident that a kind of you know multifacilitated the holistic approach is crucial for enhancing equitable technology transfer and facilitating a just transition towards climate action in the global south. So the profound impact of IP regimes and trade agreements on technology diffusion, it necessitates a, it kind of necessitates a critical examination and strategic realignment of these uh, frameworks. And uh, another thing is, uh, you know, as uh, you can see that uh, revisiting IP regimes, as I have looked into the trips, uh, we, we, I think there is a need of re revisiting IP regimes to promote technology sharing and also you know leveraging trade agreements as enablers for technology sharing is a strategic imperative uh, proactively negotiating and enhancing trade agreements with specific provisions that uh, prioritize the dissemination of climate technologies is kind of a key as i have uh, explained uh, in the previous table where uh, there is no uh, you know there is no space of uh, you know there is no provision of ip barriers for climate technologies so if there are any provisions that you know enable such kind of IP behaviors, it will be much more useful for the developing and the least developed nations to cope up with uh, the just transition. And uh, I think with that, I'll uh, finish my talk and I'll hand it over to Esther. Thank you. Uh, it was very, very nice to hear your presentation also before that um, Ken's presentation. So I'm just going to share my slides. Um, so hopefully now it's a slideshow. Um, first, I'd like to thank the organizers um, for the opportunity to be here on this panel. I think this is a really exciting and extremely important panel, especially to discuss just transition from a global south perspective. So thank you for convening and for inviting me to this panel. Uh, my name is uh, Esther Sedlacek and I'm a PhD candidate at the Free University of Amsterdam. And I'm also a PhD fellow, doctoral fellow in the adapted project uh, in, in an EU funded um, joint um, Marie Curie doctorate. And uh, my presentation today is going to be about uh, Sub-Saharan African just and low carbon transitions uh, using the case of South Africa and Kenya. And uh, so, so uh, to clarify and to start with, um, I define just transition following Harold Winkler as uh, zero carbon and zero poverty. So a uh, just transition is uh, important to, to conceptualize. And we have seen that many conceptualizations of just transition rely specifically on the energy field. Um, but this, uh, um, this uh, perspective on zero carbon and zero poverty embraces a more um, profound perspective for uh, countries of the global south uh, who need to align climate and uh, sustainable development perspectives, um, specifically poverty reduction. And uh, it's, uh, uh, this whole discussion is situated in the complex and uh, in the context of uh, the 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement, which are both uh, initiatives, global initiatives or 
agendas or institutions uh, which uh, aim to put forward an integrated whole of uh, goals and objectives which are interrelated with each other. And an increasing amount of literature and scholarship um, tries to delineate these synergies and trade-offs that take um, place between the two. Um, and uh, basically countries um, are required in this complex and fragmented global environment where actors overlap and also objectives overlap. Uh, they are required to, um, to uh, provide integrated governance measures to, to align these objectives if they desire to do so. Um, through bottom-up governance instruments such as the NDC, their own climate policies, and of course the sustainable development uh, objectives as well. And it's important to see that climate action has traditionally been understood and uh, is still being understood as, um, as something that could disrupt uh, or undermine development priorities now even more so than before in the face of green transitions. And uh, it's also important to contextualize this problem in a, in a broader uh, framework of um, distribution of harms and benefits globally, um, because uh, just transition uh, and sustainable development has uh, this intricate relationship. Uh, so, um, for instance, uh, climate change impact um, also outline who, why this topic is relevant, why this topic is relevant from a poverty reduction perspective. Uh, because uh, climate change impacts um, do not uh, significantly uh, uh, affect those who are responsible, um, which are basically industrialized and post-industrialized countries, um, and uh, African countries have not, almost not at all, uh, contributed to the problem, but uh, they are still affected the most by these uh, climate change uh, effects. Uh, we can see on the, the upper right corner uh, the African countries. Um, who are significantly the most vulnerable to climate change. And uh, it's also important to emphasize that even within these countries, it's the most vulnerable who are suffering the most from these uh, climatic impacts. Uh, so climate change impacts uh, definitely affect the poorest uh, in even in, in uh, global South countries. Uh, but also, it's very important to emphasize that not only climate change impacts affect uh, the poor uh, in a negative distributional ways um, or in a disproportionate way, but also climate action can have negative social impacts. Um, also, uh, from a within country perspective, but also from a global perspective. So it's important to see that uh, the phasing out of coal uh, it does not only uh, refer to uh, the loss uh, the loss of jobs uh, or uh, replacement of these jobs uh, through a just transition but also uh, in the broader terms of economic uh, systems or uh, political processes and uh, the country's position in value chains. And uh, this may set back significantly the economy and also socioeconomic development in the framework of sustainable development. But also we see more global tendencies for unilateral trade measures such as the carbon border adjustment mechanisms which significantly affect uh, these countries' uh, development prospects. And these impacts usually tend to fall also on the poorest. And uh, so there have also been attempts by scholars to kind of outline what um, a more integrated approaches could look like. So climate action, for instance, if it would be integrated with poverty reduction objectives, what that would look like. And so uh, there are kind of three ways uh, that this could take place according to the literature is that um, countries could try to mitigate the climate impacts falling on the poor by, for instance, social insurance, access to healthcare, uh, reduce the, the the effect of these climatic shocks uh, on the poor by increasing their um, resilience. Uh, but also they could also take actions to mitigate the, the impacts of climate action um, without falling on the poor through, for instance, green employment programs or green industrialization programs uh, with downstream benefits, localization for the poor and uh, resolving energy poverty uh, through extending access. Uh, we also see uh, quite uh, many uh, climate co-benefits or low-hanging fruits uh, that could be achieved uh, through uh, climate action with no significant additional uh, efforts required, such as uh, expanding access through renewables uh, or um, more green, green solutions uh, in, in this kind of uh, poverty reduction attempt. Uh, but it's important to see that these pro-poor approaches are uh, if they don't address the underlying political and economic systems uh, of the transition processes, they they, they will continue potentially to systematically exclude the poor and maintain the profits and the benefits of transitions um, uh, concentrated in the hands of a, of a few. 
And so uh, integration, the integration of these objectives, as we have seen in these uh, three categories, for instance, uh, it, uh, it really aims at increasing synergies and reducing trade-offs between poverty reduction and climate action or more, more broadly sustainable development objectives. And these can lead uh, to different uh, different ob uh, objectives in included, uh, and this leads to different winners and losers in processes. And uh, it's important to see that these integration processes and uh, the definition of objectives and uh, the definition of what counts as uh, synergies or trade-offs is inherently political. So uh, it's uh, policymakers and political groups uh, with uh, power or uh, less power who define um, what counts as synergy or trade-off. Although integration has so far mostly been assumed as uh, as a function of effectiveness or technical pol uh, policy capacity uh, in countries, but it is increasingly pointed out that uh, that policymakers uh, and important stakeholder groups' uh, norms and interests also really count in these processes of defining what integration will look like. Um, and uh, so, basically, this uh, the argument of the paper is coming from this assumption that uh, these integration priorities and the definition of integration priorities is uh, driven by uh, also normative uh, factors, uh, global normative factors, uh, because countries uh, previously literature shows that they tend to uh, adopt um, regime inherent norms, for instance, in their NDCs. Uh, but also these political processes, um, the global domestic interplay between these processes, uh, it is also uh, quite an important factor and uh, we could assume that uh, the dominant uh, norm, set of norms of the regime, dominant, although debated, set of norms of the regime, uh, liberal environmentalism uh, would dominate uh, these uh, transitions and the integration efforts uh, between uh, climate and development objectives. And how, how would we assess this? Uh, well, we can do so using these three types of, uh, of uh, integration in transitions. Um, this is a framework that uh, differentiates between uh, managerial, structural, and transformative reforms. And uh, basically, it, uh, it differentiates based on how um, the, the social priorities are included, but also uh, based on what kind of normative justifications are used to do so. So, for instance, is cost efficiency used? Is uh, market reliance used uh, as a uh, as a justification that, for instance, uh, the uh, green growth, uh, economic uh, growth will uh, necessarily uh, improve the situation of the poor, or what kind of uh, arguments uh, are used. So based on these three categories, I, um, I evaluated uh, in the case of uh, Kenya and South Africa. And so this is uh, just a, a brief uh, summary of the framework that I outlined, which uh, I think I will uh, go uh, forward uh, because of the time. Uh, so the methods and the case selection was guided by um, by the fact that uh, that both South Africa and Kenya are quite important uh, and as example setters uh, in the African uh, sub-Saharan African context. South Africa has been celebrated for its uh, just energy transition process, uh, but is also the major emitter in the African continent uh, and uh, with a very specific and unique uh, political historical background of the mineral energy complex. And uh, on the other hand, we have Kenya, who has also been celebrated and also kind of set an example um, uh, because uh, it has uh, very high uh, levels of uh, renewable uh, in its energy mix. But uh, at the same time, uh, poverty uh, is uh, still um, dominant and crucial, especially in terms of energy poverty. So um, basically, these uh, these two case studies were observed and uh, I had uh, conducted field trips and research studies in both countries. Um, in South Africa last year and uh, in Kenya this year, where altogether 25 interviews were conducted. This was also uh, complemented by um, participant observation at several uh, high-level events and uh, um, event recordings uh, online. So basically, uh, in the case of South Africa, we see that, uh, that the just transition priorities and the social priorities that are included uh, do uh, include uh, skills development and uh, training and uh, human resource management, uh, so to say. So basically, uh, it includes uh, active um, labor market measures, and it also does have uh, some elements of uh, social protection or a more universal coverage, such as the basic income brand. But it is mainly targeted at the affected groups of the transition, so those that are directly at risk which is uh, quite important, uh, of course, uh, but uh, but it does not have more universal um, focus groups. So um, in South Africa, it's really important uh, that the coal producing regions will lose out uh, of the transition. And basically these workers 
uh, they lose their jobs and they'll often have to relocate as well. And uh, also civil society groups to mention that, uh, that they're, um, they are highly unskilled as well, for instance, for the jobs that, uh, that require skills in the energy transition. And uh, local communities will also be impacted by env environmental and social changes. Uh, there, for instance, uh, new uh, critical mineral mines would be established or green hydrogen uh, would be established. Uh, but uh, at the same time, these uh, these priorities, these social priorities are very limited to the local localities, which would be uh, excluded by the co-production. So it's a very specific and targeted focus. Uh, and uh, at the, on the other hand, these environmental priorities that are accompanied by the social priorities um, basically mention uh, these interventions in the core region uh, and the sector jobs, resilience plans and national employment vulnerability assessments are conducted to assess which sectors um, are most affected uh, by the transition. But from an economic point of view, so the vulnerability uh, in this sense means uh, to climate proof the economy, which economic sectors uh, would be most affected and not uh, that much uh, from a human development uh, perspective. And, uh, and there are also uh, ideas uh, to kickstart EV manufacturing and uh, economic diversification uh, through industrial development. But on the other hand, there are also plans uh, to uh, to phase in green hydrogen, so to say, uh, which are basically existing in the same time. So this we can see this contestation emerging in the priorities, uh, and uh, it is still yet uncertain which priorities will prevail in the end. Uh, and uh, in the in the case of Kenya, we see that the Kenyan climate uh, documents, um, uh, though some refer to just transition. Uh, but they do so in one sentence, uh, and so it's not an actively uh, uh, an active process based on the just transition uh, global principles, which is quite interesting in contrast to the case of South case of South Africa. Uh, but we can also see that uh, that the Kenyan case more likely includes uh, social protection measures, uh, for instance, in the hunger safety net, which uh, re refer to the climate change impacts uh, on the poverty uh, in contrast to what we have seen in South Africa, which is the climate action impact uh, on poverty, which are trying to be mitigated, although on a small group. Uh, and in Kenya, we see that this is a, a bit more universal um, and also aim, is aimed at um, job retention and job creation and uh, support for a large scale renewable energy uh, industry, uh, basically. But at the same time, uh, this is uh, this does not cover the the effect of the transition um, on the the social groups. So the vulnerability of of specific social groups on um, coming from the transition from climate action is not affected. Uh, and uh, basically, this uh, this scope of priorities uh, is often also includes um, market measures, uh, which are which have been debated in literature whether they are the best uh, tools to address this problems or not, uh, besides uh, public spending, which is quite uh, limited uh, in Kenya due to structural and economic factors reaching back uh, to the structural adjustment programs um, in the early 2000s. And in the environmental priorities, we see that uh, that renewable energy uh, is, is quite uh, prevalent uh, still and, um, and also through uh, market measures uh, with the fit and uh, we we also see a huge priority on the the uh, securing a sustainable business environment and a business friendly environment for these investments and uh, to secure the 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 key performance of uh, sectors to economic shocks uh, to climate proof the economy uh, through these uh, kind of assessments and uh, so i i would like to um, reflect on the framework that i introduced before uh, in the two cases of Kenya and South Africa. So in terms of the regime inherent norms, uh, these kind of points of contestation emerge uh, in, a, in a very relational perspective uh, from a global and domestic perspective in South Africa and Kenya. So, so basically in the domestic uh, manner, we see that, uh, that the weight of the social priorities in the phase out, um, how to what extent these are included and what kind of aspects are included is, is uh, highly debated. So, for instance, in South Africa, we see that uh, that the job creation is promised uh, for for widespread uh, uh, groups, uh, basically, which are still targeted at um, at those who were previously employed by the coal industry, but uh, but these embrace uh, many people. 
Uh, but we also see that uh, that some argue that um, that these jobs uh, will not be created. And uh, in the end, uh, these jobs do not require the same uh, same type of people or same type of uh, employment uh, as uh, as it did um, previously in the coal industry. And this will not benefit these local populations. And uh, also, these will not benefit necessarily the same uh, local populations as were excluded by the coal industry. And uh, also, we have attempts to secure this kind of green hydrogen economy, which has been debated. Uh, basically, because um, securing uh, investment for green hydrogen and securing the renewables, which is very re renewable energy intense uh, process, uh, it it also means that uh, that if green hydrogen sector is the is the winner of renewables, then basically the poor are the losers of this because they will. Uh, this is a zero sum game uh, between these two uh, priorities. And in Kenya, we see that uh, that although there are significant attempts to climate proof the economy and also inclusive of social protection aspects, uh, these are more focused on the climate change impacts rather than the climate action impacts. And we also see that the, the recent energy transition and investment plan, for instance, uh, it uh, includes market measures to uh, kickstart or to uh, enhance uh, the existing large scale uh, renewable energy uh, sector. But uh, at the same time, it does not address uh, uh, energy poverty, uh, for instance, ex explicitly. And is also targeted at investment creation, uh, which is a, a very managerial aspect, which we see in both of the case studies. Um, and then we also have the depth of the transition, which is contested. Uh, this basically refers to the global and domestic uh, priorities. Uh, for instance, in the case of South Africa, I already mentioned this green hydrogen, this, this, this would benefit uh, uh, the donors who put their their uh, investment into this uh, jet IP minilateral uh, process, basically, uh, but uh, but uh, it it hardly uh, will benefit communities uh, at the domestic level if uh, industrialization or domestic localization is not included. And uh, in Kenya, we see that uh, that uh, the documents contain a lot of uh, focus on mitigation, which uh, reflects these global uh, global regime in here norms but uh, they often sideline the local adaptation needs. And uh, finally, regarding the choice of market-based instruments, in, in uh, both countries, we see a, a tendency both, both uh, from an outward looking and an inward looking perspective to embrace market measures, uh, although these are not exclusively applied. So as we have seen, the state interventions may be present or are present in the case of Kenya, but, but these are not extensive. Uh, and uh, in the case of South Africa, we see that uh, that uh, basically this uh, this whole re large scale renewables will be um, integrated into the existing uh, market system that already um, is present in South Africa. And in Kenya, these uh, there are significant green economy fiscal incentives uh, that are devoted to, to these sectors, but but there is not so much focus on the community benefits that are derived from this transition. And uh, there is also no open process of a just transition. And uh, how did the global domestic political factors shape this? Well, uh, I think I will be short because I think I have a uh, limited time now. Um, basically, uh, we see that the tendency to to uh, to have minilateral clubs, uh, which provides, although it provides global funding windows, it also has a potential independent indebtedness as a consequence. And uh, it also means that uh, that donors and investors can share a pick and also governments uh, can share a pick uh, from climate policies um, implementation, basically, because the, in a limited uh, financial environment, uh, there is really priority devoted to certain actions uh, to be implemented while others are not. And uh, while these processes are related, but they take place outside of the multilateral processes. So several interviewees also outlined concern, concerns regarding whether um, global north countries think that they that they actually um, um, with these they can check the climate finance uh, requirements that they promised uh, to global south countries and they think that this should not be sufficient but there are significant concerns regarding this and uh, also the overlapping rules and norms which means that there is uh, this uneven implementation of mitigation and adaptation in the both uh, country contexts. And uh, and also we see that uh, that al although there are public spending measures um, uh, included, uh, also that there is this focus on measures that could be interesting from an investment perspective um, to to implement them. 
And then finally, we see that there, the, while there is some focus on the social priorities, there is no formal alignment or formal integration between uh, SDG 1 as such, or the uh, whole SDG agenda, the 2030 agenda, and the Paris Agreement climate action in uh, these countries. For instance, an interviewee from South Africa uh, emphasized that uh, that no one really talks about the SDGs uh, in, the, in the country. And although uh, climate action is taking place in the framework of the Paris Agreement, this is not the case predominantly for the SDGs or for alignment between uh, the climate action and SDGs. The draft transition, we can conclude, is not taking place formally in, um, uh, in an integration between uh, SDGs and Paris Agreement. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, yes, looking forward to hearing the last presentation. Thank you. Great. Uh, many thanks, Esther, for kind of giving us a very nice um, overview, but also detailed discussion on just transition and uh, how to integrate it with the broader development agenda and two very fascinating case studies. So I'll hand over to Ruben uh, to discuss how the just transition is a contested normative framework and what the implications could be for climate governance. So over to you, Ruben. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me just uh, make sure this is um, well done so that you can see prop. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Yes, so I'm Ruben, um, and again, wonderful presentations from uh, uh, my fellow panelists. And uh, the beauty of speaking uh, last is that you, you get to hear what has been presented before, uh, but also just uh, reinforce uh, the points that have already been made, which is what uh, uh, I'll be spending the next few minutes just uh, um, sharing um, in this conversation. And so I'm focusing on um, just transition and uh, a sort of emerging, uh, albeit contested uh, sort of normative framework that is uh, sort of has the potential to shape this post-Parisian uh, phase of climate governance uh, going into, you know, uh, post-2030 and beyond. And so, as has been highlighted earlier, um, just transition is this concept, you know, that has emerged uh, particularly strongly um, over recent years. Um, and the key, one of the key pillars of that concept is to sort of reconcile uh, often contesting and competing uh, goals of climate action, pursuit of glo uh, global climate action um, with uh, realities and uh, notions of uh, domestic and social economic, uh, and in some cases, even political justice. And so what is quickly happening as the conversation on just transition uh, gathers speed uh, through literature, through negotiation, uh, and uh, even through representation in in um, key climate, global climate governance uh, instruments and mechanisms, Paris Agreement, and so on. Um, you know, it started to form this core pillar of contemporary climate governance. Um, however, it's not happening in a vacuum. And it's uh, one way to think about uh, current discussions on climate governance and the contestations therein is to think about it as an iteration of historical uh, contextual contestations, um, mainly within the North-South sort of fault line in relation to both global climate and global environmental governance. And just a quick uh, sort of reflection uh, on the Paris Agreement itself and the sort of regime, Paris, the post-Parisian regime that we have. Um, the Paris Agreement, of course, brought in uh, a different model to uh, uh, pursuing climate governance. Uh, key to it was the relative relaxation of the common but differentiated uh, responsibilities principle, um, which is a particularly crucial um, in the context of the sort of north-south uh, divide. Uh, 
in relation to, uh, amongst others, uh, the distribution of obligations when it comes to uh, the pursuit of global climate goals. And of course, you know, as we've moved forward from uh, the sort of post Paris, uh, we've seen an increased focus on uh, implementation of uh, the goals as imagined and enshrined in uh, both the Paris Agreement and the subsequent uh, policy uh, mechanisms that and positions that have emerged since. Uh, this includes uh, increasing focus on mitigation actions, uh, net zero, 1.5 degree targets, etc. And out of that, we've seen uh, increasing focus on, uh, you know, initi notable initiatives uh, that have emerged, including the net zero targets initiative, uh, a lot of focus on energy transition and shifting from carbon intensive economies. Uh, and while this has happened, um, we have kind of uh, unearthed uh, some of those real tensions, um, again, flowing mostly along the North-South uh, divide uh, on global climate uh, goals and targets uh, and the realities of uh, particularly domestic and regional realities of uh, different constituencies uh, uh, of states and actors um, in the when it comes to understanding the sort of global climate regime, broadly speaking. And as mentioned, um, this divergence um, has a historical context. Um, we can go back to 1971 uh, in the FUNE uh, report uh, which uh, came out of a conference of uh, Northern and Southern scholars um, in Switzerland, and where the question of understanding global environmental problems was put to the table. This was before um, the uh, UN uh, Conference on the Human Environment in 1972. And the key, one of the key sort of uh, outcomes of that uh, conference or the FUNE conference was this FUNE paradox where environmental uh, government problems were conceptualized. Um, and for the first time, uh, we see this problem, uh, divergence in problematization and understanding of uh, uh, what the environmental question is, the environmental problematic. And this divergence uh, flows along basically two uh, understandings. So one is that environmental issues in the global south are stemming from underdevelopment rather than industrialization. Uh, when this is contrasted from uh, the northern uh, understanding of environmental issues, broadly speaking, uh, seen as effects of industrialization and uh, uh, you know pollution problems, etc. And it is out of this divide, and you have to remember also, put this into context, this was also the time uh, when we are just emerging out of the sort of decolonial movements, uh, this decolonial period, if you like. And the focus of most of the Southern countries at the time uh, was the pursuit of uh, developmental objectives. And that included at a global level, a sort of reform of the international trade and economic architecture. Uh, and so the, the strong sense of justice um, that emerges from this period uh, shapes, or uh, rather draws the fault lines um, uh, within this sort of then nascent uh, space of global environmental governance and continues and would then continue to uh, shape um, the trajectory and uh, sort of policy direction and the discussions there in, of uh, global climate governance in its various sort of arenas, including later on um, global climate governance. And so uh, we have some key uh, sort of developments that happened in those early years that have left a significant sort of historical shadow 
into the current uh, contestations and discussions around just transition. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we had the FUNE conference preceding the uh, Stockholm in 1972. Um, and then those discussions feed into uh, the World Commission on Environment and Development report in 1987. Um, and then 92 is, you know, as we're ushering in sort of the framework convention on climate change, uh, there's that sort of shift in the Rio conference from uh, conference on human environment to conference on environment and development. Um, and so, the, you know, this embedding of uh, developmentalism within this global and, uh, framing and understanding of uh, global climate governance um, highlights uh, the kind of not just uh, conceptual differences, but also uh, the implications in terms of uh, shaping the kind of uh, global environmental governance uh, that would happen post-92. Um, and we saw this uh, represented strongly, it's not just the key principles that uh, were enshrined into the sort of global uh, climate governance like uh, CBDR, but also uh, the, the architecture uh, that uh, emerged since, you know, the Kyoto Protocol, for example, and we saw how uh, sort of the bifurcated regime uh, that emerged out of that um, architecture uh, reflected some of those uh, conceptual differences. The post parisian consensus, um, you know, jumping several years and a lot of discussions and debates in between, um, Again, as much as we we saw a sort of relaxation of uh, that sort of bifurcation, uh, but we also saw a reemergence of uh, conditionality and a reemphasis on sustainable development goals, particularly in the you know NDCs that are uh, sort of came out of the global south. You know, sixty six percent of NDCs at the time, those first NDCs, were framed in the context of sustainable development, for example. Um, this sort of reinforcement of, of uh, and yet another iteration of those early framings uh, going all the way back to the 70s. And this histor historical contextualization, um, you know, is, is critical because it's related to how concepts of justice, you know, just in the transition, interact with the pursuit of climate goals in the post-Parisian uh, uh, sort of climate uh, climate world, or world of climate governance. And so we can see uh, in studies that were done uh, at the time, you know, how conditionality was sort of ca captured in a global map. And those are the same countries that were, you know, highlighting those kind of uh, justice questions all the way back to the decolonization period. And these countries were the key demanders of embedding development um, within the sort of overarching architecture of uh, global climate governance. And uh, these demands were reflected in different ways. Uh, so for example, uh, focus on support for implementation uh, focus on adaptation uh, capabilities and things like this, which are closely aligned to and linked to um, the overarching um, uh, ideas and concerns around uh, developmentalism. And in this kind of evolution, um, we're seeing a sort of similar uh, not bifurcation per se, but a similar divergence in how just transition is conceptualized and understood in, in you know, in current conversations, as pointed out in the uh, previous uh, presentations. Um, so we have one formulation that's emerging that is uh, focused on a tight framing, focused on, you know, displaced workers, technological innovations, um, focusing on immediate economic impacts and adjustments necessary uh to effect transition away from carbon intensive uh, particularly in the energy space but another understanding uh, 
that is beginning to really uh, take uh, take shape and and sort of um, find voice is one that emphasizes a broader framing underpinned by sustainable development, uh, integrating sort of more systemic changes around the socioeconomic and environmental uh, paradigm. So it's an expansion uh, from this sort of tight techno technocratic sort of uh, uh, narrow understanding of uh, just transition and to again embed uh, concepts and ideas that are very closely aligned to not only the framings, the early framings of uh, environmental problems, of the environmental problematic, but also uh, the imperative towards uh, the pursuit for uh, developmentalism. So what emerges is that um, there's increasing interconnectivity and complexity uh, that flows along these historical uh, fault lines. And so that even in initiatives, as Ali mentioned, uh, like the Just Transition Energy, uh, Just Energy Transition Partnerships, um, you still see these kind of debates emerging as to the extent uh, and the shape of these partnerships, who benefits, who does not, how do these mechanisms work, and what exactly is uh, just in these uh, energy transition partnerships. And so, um, and this also extends to uh, some of the key agenda items that are uh, emerging this post Parisian climate uh, sort of space. So, the Bridgetown agenda, for example, um, that has a lot of focus on the reforms of international finance architecture uh, to allow developing countries to not just build up their capabilities uh, towards uh, building resilience and adaptation to. Uh, you know, climate change, um, but also uh, issues to do with sovereign debt are starting to emerge uh, within this broader understanding of what uh, just transition looks like. Um, green minerals, as we look at how sort of technologies that are being championed as uh, transformative technologies, like electronic vehicles, etc., um and issues to do with uh, mining you know cobalt in the congo uh, is a good example of what we're talking about when we talk about just transition and these questions starting to animate this kind of discussions and there are many other examples um as for example how to repurpose uh you know climate litigation and adjudicative mechanisms to uh not just address uh transition questions, but also address developmental questions. Um, and so what we're seeing is as these debates um, sort of develop and evolve um, an emerging normative framework uh, that will increasingly have influence on um, not just the future of climate cooperation, but how we imagine uh, governance, uh, climate governance in the pursuit of uh, uh, global, you know, climate goals in this post-Parisian world um, will increasingly be influenced by how uh, we manage to navigate uh, these particular um, uh, questions around just uh, transition. And so just to, you know, to wrap it up, um, of course, you know, just transition is increasingly shaping the normative environment for the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the pursuit of climate action. And there are increasingly significant and pronounced contestations based on and building from uh, those historical fault lines and historical conceptual understandings um, that will find expression in not only how we think about just transition, but we also have profound implications on the course and the future of climate action and cooperation, particularly when it comes to uh, thinking about how we move from uh, carbon intensive economies um, and embed developmental uh, concerns and priorities within uh, these moves. Thank you very much. 
Great. Thank you very much, Ruben, for your presentation and you know the taking the key message uh, that just transition is not just a technical term or a technocratic term, uh, but it's also a very contested normative framework with significant implications. So I think at this juncture, I'll uh, welcome Professor Chuck Sokareke, uh, who's been an intellectual driving force in this uh, initiative. All of us are kind of connected and putting together a special issue. And uh, Professor Sokareke, so you can give us your kind of reflections tying this discussion together, but also uh, see us through the rest of this session. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Ken. Much appreciated. I'd like to thank all the presenters for excellent um, presentations. Um, Ken, your presentation uh, points to the the dominance uh, of those from developed countries and the way in which they are particular take. Uh, of just transition and, and how they are using that intellectual dominance to project a particular take of uh, of just transition uh, and the dangers that that poses to a much more uh, variegated uh, understanding uh, of of just transition and they need to begin to challenge that uh, intellectual uh, or hegemonic uh, dominance. Um, uh, Pratap points to the fact that although certain sections are in trips like uh, 65 and 66 offers opportunities uh, for developing countries to be able to assess um, uh, technological know-how that can be used to further their action on climate change. There remains uh, incredible barriers, especially in terms of IP, uh, IP rights. And uh, illustrates this argument by showing a number of our agreements that have been signed, bilateral agreements that have been signed, where IP waivers for climate technology have not been included when they ought to, and points to a range of uh, actions that could help uh, to promote uh, climate technology diffusion to the south. Uh, ESA uh, makes a powerful argument about the need for uh, integration and synergy uh, to guide the uh, just transition effort in developing countries, but then points out that uh, current integration approaches remain mostly managerial or at best in some cases uh, structural, uh, but they don't uh, get to the transformative uh, dimension. Therefore, uh, new jobs don't often benefit uh, the same community or the same kind of people that have been displaced by uh, the climate action. In some cases, um, uh, the effort that is being put in place actually ends up benefiting the donors uh, much more than the local people. And there's uh, so much focus on mitigation uh, and not adaptation. Uh, and perhaps too much use of, uh, of market mechanisms that uh, are deeply contested. And then we hear it from Ruben, uh, Again, a, a, re, a rearticulation of the contested nature of just transition, uh, making a case, as you said, Ken, that there are two types. The one that is more narrow and focused on compensating workers, uh, frontline workers that might lose their work uh, as we make a transition to the green economy. Um, that is, if you like, speaking to this uh, technocratic uh, notion of just transition that Ken had already described in his first presentation, that is the kind of the dominant uh, framing by uh, uh, colleagues in the in the developed country, versus a much more uh, broader articulation that frames just transition in the context of sustainable development. And so going back to uh, Esther's uh, framing that 
uh, if we are to use higher and weight class definition, that uh, just transition is about zero carbon and zero poverty. We see a lot of emphasis on the former and not the latter. Therefore, an emphasis so much on the zero carbon, but not so much zero poverty. I think that uh, some of the big conclusions that we can draw from this, from my perspective, is that just transition is still so much tokenistic, is peripheral, is managerial, um, is not challenging fundamental global um, political structures um, enough. Uh, the focus is still too much on carbon uh, and, and not on development. And it might even be compromising the development rights of uh, those who have suffered from structural adjustment program, from colonialism, and who desperately need to, uh, to grow their economies, uh, albeit in low carbon ways, in order to address fundamental issues of poverty. It could actually be creating new frontiers of injustice, as have been mentioned by several presenters, um, the issue of um, uh, the CBAM, uh, but also uh, a number of other initiatives have been mentioned. It seems to me that the fundamental pillar of the global uh, governance architecture, the ethical pillar, which was CBDR, has now been uh, significantly watered down and need to be uh, reclaimed in the context of just transition by the global south. And uh, climate justice is now moving away to just transition, which seems more palatable to those whose emphasis is more on uh, the green economy rather than framing climate action in the context of sustainable development. And so the uh, scholars and policymakers are interested in justice for the global south need to engage with these key items uh, and uh, figure out a way to challenge this term, but also to work out uh, clear policies that will lead to transformative just transition. And this is where I think that the presentations sort of could a bit go a bit into, into more depth. Um, what are those specific transformational uh, or, or transformative policies, programs, institutions, norms uh, that can help to move us from the tokenistic just transition to the uh, much broader uh, just transition, if we use Ruben's framing. In terms of Pratap, what are the you talked about some pools, uh, IP pools, but what are the the the, uh, the institutional mechanisms that might be required to make those happen? What are the the, the key barriers that need to be uh, overcome? For Esther, the same question. You know, how do we move from the managerial to the transformative? And to Ruben, what are the key ways that global uh, global South, you know, policymakers and perhaps even uh, non entrepreneurs, NGOs, and scholars, what are the key, you know, uh, what should be the key focus in wrestling uh, this just transition away from this managerial and technocratic more to uh, the transformative? Uh, and if we are to succeed, uh, say Ken, how would it look like? What would the transformative just transition uh, for the global south look like? especially in the context of a much um, uh, a contestation even within the global south as, as what is the global south. How will it look like? Will it be a China and India benefiting more than Niger and Chad? Uh, so these are some of the questions that uh, I think needs to be answered. Um, so I, I would like to, I don't know, I think we, we, we're running out of time. We have just three minutes more, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, just enough time for each of you to maybe 30 seconds say one word um, based on these questions that I have posed. Uh, but I don't know if uh, Rahel Zimmerman or Stephen Bao or maybe even Aparajita has any burning question. I, and I don't understand how they can answer their ask questions in, in the webinar. I think it's probably a case of typing it in. 
Anyway, so um, let me allow the presenters to... Uh, Stefan, please go. Let me see. How does it work? Okay. Stefan, go ahead. I think you've been permitted to speak. Stefan, go ahead. I see Can your you icon. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, a, a really great session. Um, I, I would have a number of questions, but we don't have the time. And even me personally, I need to rush on to another appointment. But I would encourage us to continue the debate, uh, also including in a just transition session that we are having tomorrow um, uh, with further cases also from South Africa, amongst others. So that would be a good opportunity to continue. And I will follow up uh, with, uh, with Esther and Ruben and other, others of you, um, possibly by, by email. But thanks for this uh, great uh, and insightful session. Thank you, Stefan. Much appreciated. Um, let me see. All right. Who amongst you uh, presenters want to uh, say one word in response to my... To my uh, to my comments. I can start. So I think talking about patent pools, uh, especially for the just transition in the global south, they are uh, very helpful in like multiple ways. Um, especially when we talk about intellectual property, patent pools can actually uh, kind of, you know, they help to reduce the cost of technologies when multiple patents can be pooled together, especially the organizations, uh, the government organizations if they can come together and you know support these initiatives uh, it will really help to kind of reduce the cost of technologies and you know simplify the access and uh, they also encourage innovation and also um, at the end of the day facilitate the technology transfer thank you esther go ahead yes thank you i can also go forward so i think most important in these discussions on uh, in these countries or more globally in academia as well um, to produce evidence and to have discussions on trade-offs and on the political power and interests of uh, powerful groups in the renewable energy transition. So this is going a step further than decarbonization, which is of course in itself a difficult challenge, the zero carbon part. But adding on to that, the zero poverty seems like a challenge that is even more difficult because even if we are successful in decarbonization, that that usually means at least uh, there are signs of this in South Africa that, uh, that there are significant powerful interests shifting or new interests in the renew renewable energy sector. Uh, but uh, these are not very uh, likely to be translated uh, to, to benefits for communities, even though the decarbonization took place. So, so discussions on power in these emerging sectors uh, would be extremely uh, important uh, as we see next to discussions which already exist on uh, power in the coal sector. Excellent. Need for more power analysis. Ruben? Yes. Um, so on my side, um, in terms of sort of recapturing the sort of normative uh, discussions, um, I think one of the ways to do it is to leverage issue linkage, um, particularly in the global south where we have this intersecting uh, needs mm -hmm. um, and sort of uh, look at sort of climate adjacent uh, constituencies, uh, sectors uh, to sort of broaden uh, the tent, mm. but also leveraging uh, the sort of um, coalitions and uh, groups of uh, nations, like-minded nations, to uh, increase the collective bargaining that is then required to build on the academic work um, and evidence-based work and produce that in terms of policy design and institutional uh, negotiations and things like that. So it's a much more stronger um, voice and places where norms are actually entrenched into frameworks for climate governance. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. We've run out of time. And as Stefan says, we will continue the conversation uh, in um, several of the um, just transition panels that touch the global south, but of course, on our special issue. Thanks everyone for joining us and have a, a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you very much.